Uh, hello and uh, welcome to my talk uh, about automatic modular design of behavior trees for robot swarms with communication capabilities. So I'm uh, Jonas Kuckling. I'm a PhD student at IRIDIA, the Artificial Intelligence Lab at the Université Libre de Bruxelles in Belgium. Um, in this talk, I'm going to give a short introduction into swarm robotics and the problem of uh, automatic design of control software for robot swarms. And I will be presenting uh, Automotive Drata, a design method that tries to tackle one specific aspect um, of this problem. So namely the design of behavior trees uh, for robot swarms. Um, yeah, so the question is, what is a robot swarm? So a robot swarm is usually described as a decentralized system of relatively simple robots that needs to fulfill a certain set of characteristics. So one of these characteristics is uh, locality. So the robots can only sense and interact with the environment in their direct neighborhood. So they have no access to global information and they do not have access to information outside of the sensor range. Then swarms are self-organized. So there is no dedicated leader, no dedicated uh, pre-programmed organization. Instead, the organization of the swarm emerges from the interactions of the robots uh, among themselves and among the robots and the environment. And uh, third, robot swarms are usually highly redundant. So there is no single role in the swarm that can only be fulfilled by a single robot. Instead, since the swarms are mostly homogeneous, each role can be fulfilled by a multitude of robots. Um, these characteristics allow us to easily design uh, swarm systems that usually exhibit some desirable properties, such as scalability. So robot swarms work similarly independent of the number of robots. So a swarm with 10 robots would work in a similar fashion to a swarm with 100 or 1,000 robots. Uh, additionally, robot swarms are flexible, so they can adapt to a wide range of, env uh, uh, of, of environmental um, changes uh, because they only react locally to what they can see. So they never cared about the bigger picture. And thirdly, they are fault tolerant. So the failure of a single robot will not stop the whole swarm from performing their uh, desired behavior. Um, at the moment, swarm robotics is mostly happening inside of laboratory conditions. But recent advances make us very optimistic that uh, robot swarms will find applications in the next 10 to 15 years. So some of the recent advances are, for example, as you might have noticed or heard of uh, the new Mars mission from NASA, uh, where they have brought now a multi-robot system on Mars, including a simple helicopter. Uh, if the tests now with the helicopter are successful, we can envision that in future, future missions, NASA will not only be sending one helicopter, but multiple ones. And it is not so unrealistic to assume that they might be operating under swarm conditions on Mars. Uh, another uh, recent way of advances is that now swarms are also starting to focus on possible applications. So for example, the blue swarm, is a swarm of these fish-like robots that can operate in open waters, for example, for environmental monitoring. And we are seeing the emergence of new design technology uh, methodologies, which allow us to create even more complex control software for, ro uh, for robot swarms. And in my talk, I'm going to focus on this third uh, idea, so new design methodologies. Uh, one problem for robot swarms is how can we design control software for an individual robot that together the whole swarm uh, displays a desired collective behavior. Um, and to go a little bit further into this, so let's have a look at an example. So in this comic, we are looking at, um, yeah, Fiorella and her swarm gardening company. Um, and I will explain some of the uh, yeah, of the constraints and problems that we're facing in the uh, in the design of control software. So Fiorella has just started her own startup. She has purchased a swarm of gardening robots and she's offering uh, the services to her customers. So a customer can go online and order Fiorella services by specifying the garden layout and the tasks that the robot should do in the garden. Fiorella will then be packing her swarm and driving to the customer uh, and designing the control software in the process. And once she arrives at the customer's garden, she will deploy the swarm and the swarm will start uh, tending to the garden. So this case study highlights some of the difficulties uh, in the problem domain that we are interested in. So 
For one, Fiorella needs to tend to a large space of possible missions. So there is not only a single garden layout out there in the world. Instead, gardens have different shapes. There are different types of tasks that need to be done in a garden. And uh, the robots need to be capable of, the, or the design process needs to be able of designing control software for robots so that they can deal with any possible uh, yeah, mission or, or garden design. Then there is relatively little time for designing. So customers who order the services are willing to wait a few hours, a few days, at most a week. No customer wants to order uh, the services of Fiorella and then have to wait at least six months so that she has enough time to design the control software. Uh, additionally, with many customers ordering her services, the times uh, that are available to Fiorella are going down even more. Uh, then human intervention is not really possible in this context, mostly because Fiorella is just starting her startup. She's the only employee in her company and she is busy driving around and supervising the swarms at the customer's garden. So she cannot take the time to also oversee the design process. And a fourth problem is that the control software cannot be tested before it is deployed in the customer's garden. Uh, Fiorella does not have the possibility of building a mock garden where she can test robot swarms in before uh, moving to the customer. So the design needs to run in some kind of simulation, but once it is on the robot, Fiorella needs to be confident that it works. So these, um, these constraints, for example, make manual design not a very appealing choice for this. So mainly because there is little time and uh, Fiorella is busy driving the van and writing code while driving a car is not yet a very uh, good idea. So maybe this will change with self-driving cars, but at the moment it is not, uh, not possible. So what Fiorella would probably be interested in is automatic design of control software. So in the automatic design of control software, the design process is replaced by an optimization process. So an optimization algorithm is optimizing some uh, target architecture with regard to an objective function and is thus implicitly producing control software for the task. Uh, automatic design does not account for any human intervention besides the problem definition and um, the definition of the design method. And then automatic design methods usually work for a class of missions. So this is also in favor for uh, Fiorella. So uh, two examples of what automatic design approaches are, are for example, the neuroevolutionary design where an evolutionary algorithm optimizes the weight and possibly the structure of an artificial neural network. Or what uh, I am more interested in is the modular design where uh, the optimization algorithm is assembling a set in, of modules into a higher level control architecture, which is then used as control software for the robot swarms. So there are two ways of uh, approaching this. So one is you can be running the design and the optimization directly on the robots uh, in a kind of online design. But the problem there is then that we need a lot of iterations to be able to generate control software. And usually we do not have the time or the uh, ability to run 1000 experiments on real robots uh, just to get control software. So instead we are interested in offline design where the design problem is offloaded into simulation and only once we have the result, it is uploaded onto the robots. But this brings another challenge with it, namely the reality gap. So the reality gap is um, what is happening when we are designing in simulation and we are operating in the real world. So in between we are encountering the reality gap, which is usually associated with a drop of performance from what we see in simulation and what we see in the real world. Uh, Francesca et al. have proposed back in 2013 that we might be looking at the reality gap in a similar sense as the overfitting in machine learning. So because in machine learning, we're learning on a training sample and we are evaluating on a test sample. And in between there is a process. So, so we just assume that the model that we've learned on the training sample generalizes onto the test sample. And in a similar vein, um, Francesca et al. have said that the bias variance trade-off might be something worth uh, looking at also for swarm robotics. So the bias variance uh, trade-off is this idea that depending on the model complexity, we might have a low bias but high variance or a high bias and a low variance for low complexity models. And uh, this changes the way that we can um, that, that the uh, learning 
so, so, so that changes the way that the learning happens uh, on the training sample and on the uh, test sample. So for example, for very high complex models, something that we usually see is that the prediction error on the training sample is going very low. So we are very well fitting to the training sample. But once we are uh, evaluating on the test sample, we get a much higher prediction error. So this is usually an indication of overfitting. So the machine learning uh, model is able to learn some underlying features in the training sample that do not generalize to the test sample. Uh, on the other hand of the spectrum for uh, models that are too, uh, so that have a very low complexity, we see that they have a high prediction error both on the training sample and on the test sample. So this again is not very desirable. But luckily, usually somewhere in between, there is a sweet spot where we get a relatively good performance on the training sample and a good performance also on the test sample. And this is what we might also be looking for in swarm robotics. So neuroevolutionary approaches have often shown that they can perform really well in simulation, but that they suffer greatly from the reality gap and perform rather poorly in reality. Francesca et al, uh, they postulate that this might be because these neuroevolutionary approaches are too powerful, so they have a too high uh, complexity of their model, so a, a low bias and a high variance. And they propose uh, the automode uh, idea, which uh, introduces modules that themselves introduce bias and thus hopefully reducing the variance and bringing us closer to the sweet spot of where we have transferable controllers. The idea behind automode is that the, we have mission independent handcrafted modules that are assembled into finite state machines. And over time, we have already proposed different flavors that have different research focuses. So for example, Automode Vanilla was the first, um, first proposed automode approach that showed that indeed these, uh, yeah, this module-based uh, design was able to transfer from simulation into reality quite well. Uh, other approaches are adding, for example, new functionality. So in Automode Waffle, we have um, added the ability to not only add software modules to the design, but also hardware modules. So now we can exchange uh, the hardware on the robot. Uh, in Automode Maple, we have uh, changed the design architecture from finite state machines onto behavior trees. And in Chidrata, what I will be presenting now in the talk, we have uh, implemented new modules that have been designed explicitly for the use of behavior trees. Um, a behavior tree or behavior trees in general have been developed in the video game industry as an alternative to finite state machines. Um, mostly because finite state machines became unmaintainable, the larger the behavior for a certain class of NPCs got. Uh, behavior trees, on the other hand, are highly modular so that you can decompose or uh, combine uh, behavior trees into a larger behavior tree. Um, and we think that this might be a very interesting appeal also for our automatic modular design. Um, behavior trees work on a tick. So every control cycle, a tick is entering the tree. And depending on the inner nodes of the tree, is taking a certain path until it reaches a leaf node. The leaf nodes that can then return success, failure, or running. And depending on the return value, the tick might be taking a different path through the tree until it is hitting another leaf node. And from there, at some point, it will be returned out of the tree. At the next control cycle of the uh, control software, the tick will enter the tree again and might be taking the same way or might be taking a different way for the tree. Um, one problem that we have encountered in Swarm Robotics is that the individual behaviors of robots usually do not allow the definition of success or failure. So one of the reasons is that maybe the tasks are too simple and might be running on for an infinite time. So for example, a typical Swarm Robotic behavior for a single robot is broadcasting. There is no success or no failure to broadcasting. You just broadcast a message. And at some point, you want to stop, but there is no success underlying to broadcasting. Or what happens uh, also sometimes is that we do have success or failure, but these are highly mission specific. So for example, there often is a homing behavior, which brings the robot to an area of the arena, which is considered to be home. But the idea of where is home and how can we distinguish where is home usually is highly dependent on the mission. So it could be the floor color. It could be a certain color uh, that the robot can perceive with a camera. It might be a beacon that is sending uh, messages. 
So this makes it very difficult to define a mission independent homing behavior that is able to find the home independent of what the home would be in the mission. Uh, nevertheless, we have defined seven behaviors for Chidrata, which are usually based on bidirectional communication, so about sending and receiving uh, signals from other robots. So in our set experimental setup, we have been testing Chidrata on different uh, numbers of, uh, so on, on different design budgets, the higher the number, the more, the longer the uh, design process can run on. And as a point of reference, we have also included Maple. So Chidrata and Maple are targeting different robots with different capabilities. So it's not really fair to compare those two uh, directly against each other, but it might give us a feeling of how well Chidrata can perform. Uh, additionally, and in the same idea, we have asked uh, some experts to manually design control software that can be uh, compared against Chidrata and is designed within the same constraints of Chidrata. And we have also included a reference design, which has been conceived outside of any experimental setup and just be, uh, can be used as a further reference point. Um, so the swarms are comprised of 20 EPUB robots, which are just simple uh, robots that can move through the arena and perceive the floor color and send and receive messages. Um, we consider three missions. So in foraging, the robots need to bring items from the black food sources into the white nest. Uh, since the robots, so since the EPACs do not really have any gripping abilities, we're just interested in an abstract idea uh, of this foraging where they just need to pass over the spots to pick up an item and to pass over the nest to drop off the item. Um, a second mission that we are interested in is the marker aggregation mission where there is a invisible area uh, here denoted by a dotted line in which the robots should aggregate as quickly as possible. Uh, additionally, there is a black marker at the center of this area and the robots can only sense the black marker but not the rest of the area that they should aggregate in. Um, we hope that with Chidrata, the robots are able to develop some kind of communication strategy where once they find the black marker, they tell their peers to quickly aggregate inside of the target area. And lastly, we have a mission called Stop, where there is a white spot uh, in the arena, and the robots need to explore the arena. And once they find the black, uh, white spot, they need to stop as quickly as possible as a whole swarm. Again, we hope that there is a communication strategy that can be developed by Chidrata, where the robots, after finding the white spot, communicate this knowledge to the rest of the swarm, who will then be stopping as quickly as possible. So let's have a closer look at some results. So in this case, especially of the marker aggregation mission. So uh, here in the plot, we see that with increasing um, yeah, with increasing design budget, also our performance increases for Chidrata, which is uh, very interesting. But what is even more interesting is that if we have a detailed look, we see that Chidrata basically discovers two strategies. Uh, one of the strategies is using communication, while the other one is not. And especially for our higher design budget, the performance only depends on the ratio of these discovered strategies. So within each strategy, Chitrata is able to find the best performing or a quite good performing uh, instance of control software, but the overall um, test over 10 independent designs uh, depends on the number of different, uh, on, on this ratio between the two discovered strategies. So if we have a look at the communication less strategy, so the one that does not use communication, we see that the robots are simply exploring the arena and once they find the black spot, the robots are stopping. So over time, it means that the robots are aggregating inside of the marker, uh, so inside of the invisible area, but um, it's not really, uh, yeah, it's not really directed. So it's just by pure chance that the robots are detecting the black area. And if access to the area is already blocked by other robots there, then the robots will just leave again after some time and continue exploring the arena. On the other hand, where we see communication, it starts out similarly. So the robots are exploring the arena, but once they find the black spot, they start sending out information to their peers and the other ones are quickly attracted towards the same region. So as we can see in a much shorter time, many more robots are able to aggregate uh, inside of the invisible area. Um, yeah, so if we compare this then against the design by the experts, we see that they come up with similar solutions. So they perform similarly well uh, as the uh, communication-based strategy uh, discovered by Chidrata. 
Uh, and Maple, which does not have access to communication and therefore relies on the communication less strategy, is about as good as the communication less strategy uh, discovered by Chidrata. So it seems that Chidrata is able to uh, make use of its module in a, in a yeah, satisfactorily way. So this is something that we also see that holds for the other two mis uh, missions that we considered. So in foraging, neither Chidrata nor the experts were able to devise a communication-based strategy to communicate the positions of either the food sources or the nest. So instead, they simply rely on exploration and uh, on pure luck of finding all of these things. Uh, on the other hand, in the stock mission, the experts were able to devise a communication-based strategy, but Chidrata was unfortunately not able to find a strategy that makes use of communication. So to conclude this, uh, in this work, we have defined uh, behavioral modules for robot swarms that allow for explicit success and failure. Um, this is a first step towards using behavior trees also in swarm robotics. Um, Manual, the manual designs within the constraints of Chandrata found very well performing behavior trees. So this is a validation of the modules that we have defined. They seem to have the capabilities that we are interested in. However, the optimization process itself had some difficulties in finding these communicating behaviors. And uh, this leads us to the future work. So we want to investigate the influence of certain parameters of the optimization process in the hopes that we can steer it to a more explorative behavior so that it might be finding these uh, communicating behaviors. Uh, on the other hand, we also might be investigating a different optimization algorithm altogether. So for example, genetic programming lends itself very nicely to the tree-like structure that behavior trees are, uh, are having. And then in future work, we also want to expand the module set to include more behaviors and more conditions and make this a well-rounded uh, available framework for swarm robotics. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jonas. So I think we have time for well, lots of questions because uh, my talk is next. And I don't mind delaying it. So anyone has a question? Well, uh, I do have a question. So. Uh, I mean, in all the cases you have mentioned, in all the examples you have mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, essentially what you needed was open-ended evolution. Uh, on the other hand, what, what you what you are showing is, is basically closed evolution. So you you, you evolve swarms uh, for a specific task. Do you think it would be extremely difficult to to go from this uh, directed evolution to other kind of open-ended evolution that could uh, be used on, on you know on some environments that uh, that would be unknown? Um, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. So we have actually not yet started to thinking about uh, this, but um, so I think it could be indeed possible. Uh, so at the moment, we're usually uh, thinking about this mission-based um, design because this is how we think about uh, the problems in swarm robotics. But I think it could be also very interesting to look at a more open-ended uh, design indeed, yes, open-ended evolution, yes. Thank you very much. Any other question? So I think that's basically it. Uh, thank you very much. Another virtual applause. <laughs>